Well, I would say good afternoon, but in Canada, we have six different time zones. So for wherever you are joining us from, uh, have a good day. Uh, je suis Charlie Angus, le député fédéral de Timmins Bay James. Watche, bonjour. Charlie Angus here representing um, on the traditional territory of the Timiskaming First Nation in the beautiful woodlands of Northern Ontario. And hello from here where it is the afternoon. This is Mary Lou MacDonald in Dublin, the capital city of Ireland, saying bonjour, hello, and sending the saying the aguich the eve to all of you wherever you are and in whatever time zone you find yourselves. I'm absolutely delighted to have this opportunity to talk to you, Charlie, and to talk to the great people of Canada. Well, Mary Lou, I'm really excited to have this opportunity for us to talk. Uh, the connections between the Irish people in Canada that run so deep. Uh, I mean, you cross the country, every little village, there's an Irish town name or county name. Um, our connections are emotional, cultural, familial, and everyone here has watched Dairy Girls. Um, so I think we're all feeling very close right now. But one of the things I just wanted to say off the top that strikes me is I think a lot of Canadians aren't aware that we have deep political ties, particularly in the peace process. We had a number of key Canadians who played real roles at making sure that the peace process got off the ground and also making sure that you know the UK played its part. So I hope we're gonna get to talk a bit about that today, but I wanna just start off quickly on something that we, we also are sharing, which is the pandemic. And I just wanted to get your view on what's happening over in Ireland for people in Canada to get a sense of, we've got the two jurisdictions, North and South, how is it playing out with the pandemic? Well, I suppose, Charlie, we're, we're no different to, to people right across the globe. This virus is vicious. It's awful. It has laid low our economy. It has posed a huge and real threat to our health services. Lives have been lost. More than 3,000 people have died across the uh, island. That's, that's a big number for a small population uh, such as ourselves. So it's, it's been a huge challenge. And as we currently speak, obviously people are preparing for December and into Christmas time, which is a huge family celebration, huge occasion. The, the restrictions that we've had here in the Southern jurisdiction, the 26 counties are being eased uh, from next week uh, onwards. In the North, they're being tightened and, and more harsh restrictions are being uh, imposed. So it's been a really, really ro rocky road. It's been immensely challenging. And of course, all the more so because we have two jurisdictions on the island. Um, ideally, what we need is a single plan, a single strategy and a single approach right across Ireland. But that hasn't been the case. And unfortunately, uh, our unionist colleagues, or at least some of them, when this at the beginning of this crisis, were looking more to Boris Johnson and London than to Dublin or indeed the World Health Organization. So it's been challenging. Uh, I suppose the good news is that we're hearing that vaccines uh, will be available sometime soon. And uh, I guess we're, we're hoping that we will get um, distribution of those vaccines uh, across the island in a coordinated and effective way. And in the meantime, we need to be careful. We need to mind ourselves, mind each other, wear our masks, wash our hands, keep our distance. So. That's the story in, in Ireland, that's the story in Canada, and that's that's the reality, isn't it, for all of us right across the globe. And can I send our greetings of solidarity to the people of Canada and deep sympathy to people who have been sick or who are sick, and, and most especially to people who have been bereaved. This has been a really heartbreaking time for, for, for those people and their families. Well, well, thank you so much for that. I, I, one of the things that I, I, I'm really interested in talking you, with you about is uh, the, the big breakthrough Sinn Féin's had. Uh, the polls are really strong right now, it looks. And, you know, there's the old boys club politics everywhere, but I don't think there's anything quite like the old boys club politics of Ireland. Um, and you've really shaken it up. And I think it's really interesting because it's about a progressive vision. It's about pushing hard on social issues where a younger generation is, is moving. So talk to us a bit about uh, uh, being, being a, a, the feminist voice uh, in, in the old boys politics in Dublin and how much uh, that's changing the face of Ireland. 
Well, yeah, I mean, as you know, we are um, in government in the executive in the north of Ireland in the six counties and, and then down south here mm -hmm. in Dublin and across the 26 counties. We now lead the opposition in the Dáil. And I am the first woman, uh, Charlie, to ever lead the opposition uh, in the Dáil, in the Parliament here in Dublin. It only took a hundred years. What can I tell you? So, um, so yeah, I mean, we have we've marked uh, moments of big change and big progress, moments of of great challenge as well. But overall, the story for us as uh, Republicans, Irish Republicans in Ireland, the the story is is one of huge positivity. On the one hand, because politics has changed. I think there's almost been a generational turning of the wheel in Irish political life, north and south. And so, as you as you have pointed out, Charlie, you see a politics that is marked by modernity and progress and change. And the appetite for that change is palpable, particularly amongst younger people and younger voters, but not just younger people. That's That's what happens, as we know, when when, when a, a real generational shift occurs, it brings everybody with it, uh, not just not just the, the the younger the younger folks. So all of that is very exciting. It means things that were were taboo uh, or that could not be talked about or progressed a, a generation or or more uh, ago are now very much uh, on the table. And then the second element, which is all bound up with this is the journey uh, now towards reunification and the ending of partition on our island. And that conversation and journey is well underway. Um, and it is a time of immense excitement and immense opportunity, uh, but it's not going to be easy to get to where we want to be. It's going to be challenging and it's going to require all of us, women and men and younger people, older people, to really put our shoulder to the wheel. But we have here, we're, and we're so lucky. I mean, we have been, we've been dogged by partition and division and conflict, as you know. But, but now we're actually blessed with an opportunity that I think others in, in other nations would, would give, give very much, uh, give anything to have. And that is the opportunity to reset, to rebuild, um, to, to end division in Ireland, to end partition, and actually to build a new republic. And that's that's hugely exciting. And you're quite correct to refer to me. I'm, I'm a Republican, I'm the leader of Sinn Féin, and I very proudly proclaim myself as a feminist interested in equality for women, uh, equality for every citizen, for our children, for our older citizens. And that for me has to be a, a bedrock. It has to be at the core of building a new Ireland. And that's really, Charlie, how in the end we kind of dismantle this old boys club, you know, the, the old device of broken politics, and we build a new. Well, it, let's talk then about partition in the peace process, because uh, I think that's something that uh, we we see that as one of the great success stories of the last two decades. It To me, it's it's something we have to really fight for and, and celebrate. And I'll just interject my own family story here as little as it is, but uh, you know, I, I always say I got my music and my religion from the Catholic side of my family, but my politics from my Presbyterian grandmother. Uh, and my grandmothers, uh, they, I remember them listening to the radio, you know, in little mining town in Northern Canada. And every time there was a story of uh, one of the, the bombings or a killing, the grief they had. And it was my Presbyterian grandmother who always talked about peace in, in Ireland. And she used to say to me uh, that, the Irish people together would find that solution and that had to be the only way we would get there. So for me, this is a really important conversation. It's something that I've, I've dreamed of that we would, we would see this and we're 20 years in. So I guess I gotta, I gotta just say it pretty bluntly. So how does the leader of Sinn Féin uh, talk to you know, an unemployed Protestant youth on the Shank Hill Road or someone in Armagh and say, our future is together in a united Ireland. How, how is that conversation going? How do you do that? And how do you bring uh, the loyalist, people who grew up in a loyalist tradition into this conversation so they feel very much part of a future Ireland? Well, I'm very much with your grandmother, uh, Charlie, how, how, wise, how wise a woman she was. And the truth is that the, the solutions to our problems, to our differences, um, are, are within us. 
um, and uh, Ireland, Irish people of all political persuasions, those of us that are Gaels and um, and uh, Irish solely, others that, that regard themselves and who are British, we, we have it within ourselves, not alone to find the answer to the problems that we face and the things that have divided us, but really, really critically to forge ahead in all of our diversity and ingenuity um, to build an Ireland that is home for everyone, Catholic, Protestant or dissenter, uh, people of, of all faiths and none, people of um, all colours, um, women and men uh, of, of all classes. That, that has to be the ambition and to give a short answer, and it's, it's short, but it's not meant to be trite. I hope you can hear the profoundness of what I am about to say to you in a very simple uh, way is to have that conversation with uh, our friends on the Shankill Road or people from a loyalist or a, a, a unionist or simply a Protestant background. We have to firstly invite them to the conversation. So the building of a new Ireland is everybody's business. It's not simply a, a Sinn Féin project, although of course we are to the fore in advancing this cause because we believe without a doubt that Irish unity is the very best idea for all of our people to prosper, to flourish and to thrive. But I'm very, very conscious as the leader of Sinn Féin that we have to make room for everyone. And we have to be conscious of the fact uh, that others will have diverse and varied perspectives as to how this new Ireland will look and, and operate. So we need to have a willing ear. Um, we need to acknowledge each other. We need to acknowledge each other and accept difference. We should not be attempting to straightjacket people into a single or singular sense of identity because that would not be true. That's not true of the story uh, of Ireland. We have um, diverse uh, pasts. We've had different experiences of the past. The conflict in Ireland is contested as to why it happened, who was right, who was wrong. The border on our island is, is contested. So we have a lot uh, of contested matters, some of which we can resolve in time. Others we won't. And we simply need to accept that there isn't a single narrative of Irish history. We need to be respectful of that. And then, Charlie, preparation is, is going to be key for the reunification project. So, I mean, we have been saying now for some time, and I have said to the Taoiseach, uh, here in Dublin, the current Taoiseach and, and the previous one, that the preparation needs to start now. We need a space, uh, a citizens' assembly or a forum where the conversations, the planning and the preparation can take place. But, but I think in the first instance, and maybe the, one of the most important things that I can do as the leader of Sinn Féin is to make it absolutely plain to everyone that each and every one of us has a part and has a stake in this conversation and that I and we are willing to hear, to listen, to share ideas because as we chart our way forward, we, we have to be sure that we are playing to the very best um, of, of every section of our society. And I think it's all doable, but we are gonna have to be organized. We have to be practical. I'm sure your grandmother, when, when she realised that the answers to the Irish question are in Ireland, I'm sure she always also would have recognised that being organised and prepared, be all of, you know, uh, is, is, is a critical part. And then finally, Charlie, um, international support, um, international um, influences have always been core to the Irish journey and the Irish story. That was the case a century ago. That was the case, you know, at, at, at the dawning of, of the peace process and the signing of the Good Friday Agreement back in 1998. And that will certainly be a critical element uh, in, the, in the story and the journey to Irish reunification. And Canada will matter, will matter greatly in the next chapter as we now write the next chapter of Irish history. Well, I, let's let's just talk about that for a second because uh, I think Canadians again we 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 tend to notice our our, our big American cousins because they carry big sticks diplomatically. But in the peace process, 
we had Warren Almond, uh, who was a very powerful, impressive uh, presence. Uh, General De Chastelin in the uh, in the whole push, you know, to, to to for getting rid of the armaments. But we had, you know. Uh, the former Supreme Court Justice Peter Corey, who pushed for the inquiry into the collusion between um, the, some of the paramilitaries and, and the British state, uh, Professor Shearing on police matters. Mm -hmm. So we have a tradition, we have, we have a stake in this as Canadians. Considering the situation with Brexit right now and um, the mishandling, I think, of, of, of the negotiations with the EU, what role could Canada play on this? in terms of making sure that Boris, I mean, we can't tell Boris Johnson uh, what to do on a number of things, but we can say there are rules. We have a treaty. We have, we, we fought for this treaty that's international. Uh, what role could Canada play in making sure that those Brexit negotiations include a fairness for Ireland and the open border with North and South? Well, I think the short answer is a, a hugely influential role. I mean, Canada can be incredibly influential in these uh, matters. And to start with Brexit, uh, as, you, as you'll be aware, Brexit is massively disruptive. I mean, I think it's crazy. That, that's mm -hmm. my view. But if, if Britain wishes to Brexit, who are we to stop them if that is their decided uh, uh, direction? Uh, what they can do is, in the course of Brexit, uh, wreck Ireland and undermine our peace process. And as you have said, the Good Friday Agreement, all of the successor agreements are international agreements. They're between two sovereign governments um, and they need to be honoured. And in the course of what have been very, very lengthy Brexit negotiations between Michel Barnier and the European institutions on the one hand, and the British state on the other. Uh, we did land finally on a withdrawal agreement and a protocol that, that boxes off the, the, the absolute essential protections that the Irish economy, that Irish citizens and that the Irish, uh, the Irish peace process requires. At the core of that is ensuring no hardening of the border uh, mm -hmm. on the island of Ireland as, as people who are uh, part of this conversation will, will realise any that have been to Ireland, you tra travel now seamlessly north to south, south to north across the, the island. There really isn't a border for all practical purposes and we fully intend that it remains that way. I think it is probably the biggest um, symbolic and practical win of the Irish peace process is that, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, there, there isn't the disruption uh, of old and people, of course, live their lives on a cross border base. It wouldn't be unusual for a farmer to go into their uh, home place on the southern part of the uh, island and then exit into a, a, a field at the back and they're in the northern jurisdiction. So, so we're absolutely essential that that needs to be protected. Unfortunately, the British government have uh, chosen to play what I regard as a very, very dangerous game of brinkmanship with that withdrawal agreement. Um, they have published legislation through Westminster and into the Lords, which they say very openly breaches international law and which threatens to undermine the basis of, um, of the withdrawal agreement and the protocol. And that simply cannot happen. And I, I think it is very important that international um, players and international partners make it plain to the British government that you cannot play fast and loose with international law. And so it is the case with the Brexit uh, agreement. I mean, the, the United States has made it clear that if there is any damage to the island of Ireland or the Good Friday Agreement, there will not be a trade agreement with Britain. Um, I, I believe that it would be extremely positive and helpful if Canada were to equally adopt that position, not because we're asking for favoritism or that, you know, people play favorites with Ireland, but, but simply because in, in the world that we live in, the rule of international law has to mean something. Um, mm -hmm. And you, you referenced many people, General de Chastelin, who was absolutely critical in the um, decommissioning in the course of the peace process, arguably the most sensitive and difficult part of the peace process. He was central to, to holding the ring 
in a fair and a firm way to ensure that that could happen. You, you mentioned Justice Corey, the late, great, the late uh, Justice Corey, again, uh, who produced a, a report around collusion and particularly the, the case of, of, of Pat Finucane. Um, and, and the history of Canada has been the history of, of holding people to the rules and to the rule of law. And from my perspective, if you know, you say, well, what does Canada bring? I think that's what Canada brings. I think that's what Canadian politics and the Canadian kind of disposition brings that rigor and fairness and adherence to, to, to the rule of, of law. And I would hope throughout Brexit and beyond Brexit that that would continue to be the case. Well, I, I, it was interesting because uh, we know definitely the Irish uh, presence in, in Congress is very clear and strong. We have a very strong Irish presence in our parliament, but again, it tends to be cultural. Um, a lot of uh, warm events that we have around St. Patrick's Day, but I was certainly surprised when the Prime Minister uh, announced uh, that he was willing to immediately sign a trade deal with the UK, which, you know, again, we have deep, deep roots with the UK, but he did not mention uh, the Irish issue. And I think that across party lines here, we have an opportunity to remind the Prime Minister of the history. Um, and so I think if there's something we can do on that area, it would be very important for Canada to send that message that we have to keep this process strong. We have to keep that border open and the ability of the two communities to work with each other to to a unified Ireland. So to that, how do you see the, the, the step towards uh, Irish reunification? Is it is this a, I mean, it's been a hundred years plus since uh, 1916 and uh, many people wonder if it'll ever happen. Do you see this process happening and how does it happen in a way that brings well, people well, together? Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I absolutely see it happening. And in fact, next May, we will mark a century of a partitioned I Ireland a um, hundred years of partition and partition has been just devastating for the island socially, economically, mm. in every respect. There, there have been no winners from partition. Um, and of course, the border is a contested border and that's why we had conflict and that's why we have a peace resolution and international agreements and international law uh, in respect of all of that. The ending of partition, the methodology is set out in the Good Friday Agreement. It is by way of referendums, north and south, uh, to end partition. So in other words, once there is a majority, north and south, for the ending of partition, um, the British government will be obliged to respond in kind uh, and to legislate uh, accordingly. On the calling of the referendum itself from the British side, it, it lies with the Secretary of State as per the agreement. But the reality is that that really would be a call for whoever would be in number 10 Downing Street. It would be a, a call for the British Prime Minister. And in fact, uh, each time we meet the British Prime Minister, and in my case as leader of Sinn Féin with uh, Theresa May and Boris Johnson, I have said to them consistently that they need to set out what their understanding is of the kind of threshold that we have to meet for the calling of such a referendum, and they failed to do that. But we're mm. going to we're going to keep pressuring them uh, to to do exactly that. So, in one way, the method of this happening is actually straightforward. It is a vote, fifty percent plus one, in a referendum decides the matter. The more complex piece is what lies behind that, because I think it is only fair and reasonable when you are asking people to make the change and to end partition, that we have a sense and that we have a worked out strategy for what a reunified uh, Ireland would look like. And therein lies the big challenge and therein lies the level of pre preparation that, that, I, that I referred to earlier. I mean, I, I can't overstate the need for that preparation to start now. The government in Dublin for their part would say to you, no, it, it's an important matter, but it shouldn't happen now, it can't happen now. They're burying their heads in the sand because the winds of change are blowing. This, this process and this conversation is underway. And I think at this stage, it's actually reckless of, of a government in Dublin not to realize that this change is in prospect and not to make the, the, the necessary preparations. And I'd say the same for the government in London. There will be no prizes for those who wish to look the other way and pretend 
the change is not happening. It is. And so we need a strategy at, a, a, at the high level politics, but also in the grassroots to effect an orderly constitutional transition. And that will be challenging. It's doable. It is all absolutely doable. And to answer your question, Charlie, yes, this is going to happen. I believe that we will have ended partition within this decade. I'm absolutely confident that that will be the case. I want us to have the referendum, win it first time out and win it well. And that means that it now is the time for all of that preparatory work. Um, and of course, international solidarity in that, that phase of preparation. Um, and in, in that sense that, that I think quintessentially Canadian thing of, of fairness and balance um, and, and rigor, you know, in, in holding, uh, holding the ring for, for conversations that will, will be challenging in many cases. And we need to learn from international experience. And we've had huge uh, and, and really welcome interventions from very, very notable Canadians from different walks of life. And I have no doubt that we will be looking to you uh, in the future, in the very near future, for that type of assistance again. Well, I I appreciate that, and we certainly appreciate that. Uh, we have deep, uh, you have lots of friends. Ireland has many friends in every village and city in this country, and, and I think all of us want uh, a future for Ireland that is progressive, that is peaceful, and that there is one Ireland for all Irish people. So uh, I thank you for joining us. I wish we could have been doing this in person, but um, once the pandemic's over, uh, we invite you to come to Canada to meet with us. And certainly I'd love for, to, for you to come and meet with some of our parliamentarians, again, across party lines. Our relations with the Irish people are strong and we wanna play a role uh, in that future and in a better Ireland uh, that is possible. This. This could be one of the, it was a great story. The, the peace process was one of the great stories of the last 20 years. I, I think the next chapter could be one of the, the great stories of this coming century. So we want to play our little part in it with you. So I want to thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. Thank you so much, Charlie. It's been a pleasure. Great to see you. And I look forward to seeing you in person yes. and to visiting Canada um, as, as soon as ever I can. So, Gurumila Mahabud. Thank you so much. Take care.